Hey everyone, I'm back with another lecture video on the South Asian realm. Um, again, I talk about this all the time and I, I always take more time than I want to. This is one that has the potential to, it could go really long if I really talked about everything in this slideshow. So probably I'll talk a little bit more at the first of it and then kind of breeze through the second part of it because, of course, all this information in here is in your textbook. So I want to use these PowerPoints because they're familiar to you, because they're material right in your textbook, but I'm not going to talk about all the, the content in them because it's there, and what I want to do is kind of fill in the blanks and let you know kind of current events, how they fit in the world today. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So that's why when you watch these, if you do watch these whole videos, You'll see me kind of glide through some of these and not talk about some of the slides very much. So I wanted to just point that out before I got started here on this one. So South Asian realm. So basically, <clears throat> South Asia is going to be the country of India. That's the big hitter here. Now, there are some countries around India that are also included in South Asia, and they are important as well. Um, Especially to the west of India, you have Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now, these are both Muslim countries. Afghanistan is considered kind of a transition country because it's as closely related to the Middle East, Naswa, that we covered earlier. This is Iran right here. So, we're really close, and as far as the geography, the physical geography goes, it's similar to those, but it's kind of a transition area into Southern Asia. Um, Pakistan is the other one. It's also a Muslim country, but it's becoming more and more like India physically as you move through the country. You see it gets a little greener over here. This is a physical map. This is an elevation map, actually. But also, if you saw a map of vegetation that I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes from Google Earth, it matches that that green in these areas where it's a little lower and then a little higher as well. So we also have Bangladesh, which is on the eastern side of India over here. And it also is a Muslim country, even though it's separated by India, which is not a predominantly Muslim country. Um, it also is Muslim. We have Nepal. You have Bhutan up here. And you have Sri Lanka down here, the big island at the southern tip of India. Notice the countries around this region. I already pointed out you have Iran over here. And it's part of the NASWA, the North Africa Southwest Asia realm that we studied earlier. And then up in this area, you see all those central Asian countries related to Russia. The, the Stan countries, they call them. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all these countries are up in this area here. And then you got China. <clears throat> so when you look at these countries, <clears throat> you've got basically the two most populous countries. And just these two countries, India and China, <clears throat> excuse me, there's more people in those two countries combined than the rest of the world. So this is a very populous region, although this part of China here. It's probably the least populated of that country. Its population grows as you go further east. Whereas India, pretty much the entire country is highly populated. Pe the population density, the people per square mile or kilometer, that we're going we're gonna to see a map of that in just a little while, um, is enormous in India. So the population is really spread out in India. Another thing we're going to note in a few minutes is India is one of the few major countries in the world that has a higher population of people that li actually live in the countryside than live in cities. Although they have numerous cities that are very large because, I mean, they've got around 1 billion people in this country. It's, it's enormous with regards to population. So they've got a lot of really big cities, but they also have a whole lot of people that live in the countryside. And you're going to see those populations are focused on where you see most of the green here because that's some of the, the flatter areas, the more productive areas agriculturally, so you're going to have more people living there. 
So, one thing to keep in mind, we're going to talk about the physical geography of Indy here in just a few slides. So, just a couple of big hitters here before we get started. First of all, you're often going to hear Indy is referred to as a subcontinent. So, we're going to talk about that, why it's called a subcontinent, even though it's part of the Asian continent. Um, there's a lot of different cultures and languages and even religions in the country. Um, it was colonized by the British, so English is a popular language there. Not everybody speaks English, but probably a higher percentage than a lot of other countries do speak English there. And I've already mentioned the other two points about your transition zone in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So here's an image I pulled off of Google Earth. <clears throat> Just to give you a little bit better idea. So, of course, you know this is satellite imagery. So this is showing basically vegetation and the density of vegetation and the type of vegetation. So again, look at the same way we just looked at it before. You've got Afghanistan up here, Pakistan right here. These are two, especially Afghanistan is considered a transition country from the north, northern Africa, southwest Asia realm. This is Iran. If you remember Iran, Saudi Arabia's over here. So this is Afghanistan, and you probably heard about Afghanistan a lot in the news because of our military endeavors there, and I'm going to mention those when we get to that, that part of the slideshow. Then you've got Pakistan is try to, kind of transitioning here because you have a major river flowing through Pakistan, and its delta is down here. It's the Indus River. Now, the in, remember, the Indus River, it sounds like India, right? <clears throat> Actually, most of it flows in Pakistan, and the delta is in Pakistan right next to it. But you see the vegetation is picking up down here than you see over here. So that can sustain more people and that's why we have more people in India. So another thing to pay attention to is you see a very sharp dividing line right here. And you see the country of Nepal and Bhutan up here. And you actually see some white up here. That is ice and snow. That is, some of those are glaciers. Um, these are the Himalayas, the tallest mountain chain in the world. Mount Everest is here. The tallest single mountain in the world. And you can see it's a very stark line, very green on the south side, southwest side, and up here it gets a little bit drier. Now, you're from, you're, if you remember from our earlier realms, especially um, South America, and we talked about Central America as well. We talked about the rain shadow effect. And that's what we have going on here. The weather basically comes from the southwest to the northeast. Slams in here. All this precipitation falls, but it's the heaviest right along this front side of these mountains. Once it goes over the mountains, it's lost out its moisture and it's drier on the back side of these mountains. So that's why you see this stark line right here. This is also the reason that we call this the Indian subcontinent. These mountains are really high, and they're relatively new. Now, I say that. That's geologically speaking. They're still millions of years old, but they're relatively new with regards to the geologic record. At one time, y'all probably are familiar with Gatlinburg and the Smoky Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains that we studied in our first realm. Those mountains were as big or bigger than these. But that's a very ancient mountain chain. It was formed billions of years ago. Therefore, it's eroded down over its lifetime, and they're pretty small now compared to these. These are relatively newer mountains because there's a tectonic plate that is basically the Indian plate that used to be down here, and it's moved to the northeast, and it slammed into the continent of Asia. And when it did, it basically crunched up the ground and elevate it up to make these mountains. So this plate slammed into Asia, and that's why you see this mountain chain here, and that's why it's referred to sometimes as the Indian subcontinent, because at one time it kind of stood alone, kind of like Australia does now, as its own continent. But at some point, millions and millions of years ago, it slammed into the Asian continent. So that's why we call it that. So here's kind of a graphic of that that Indian subcontinent back in the day, back, here's the million, 55 million years ago. So it came up here and just slammed into the 
the existing Eurasian plate. I said the continent of Asia. That's called the Eurasian plate. It's all big one plate. It slammed in here, and that's where you get the Himalaya, Himalaya Mountains, right along here. So, let me see. You've got two really, actually three really big river systems. We think the two are really popular <clears throat> as far as you kind of recognize the names, the Ganges and the Indus. And if we go black a slide, I've already told you the Indus is over here on the western side of India, kind of along the Pakistan border with India. The Ganges flows along the front side of the Himalaya Mountains through mostly India, but it actually has its delta down here in Bangladesh. There's also another great river that flows from this corner of India, and this is all still part of India, by the way. It kind of surrounds Bangladesh there, <clears throat> and it flows through this part of India, joins the Ganges, and flows into the same delta. That's the Brahmutra River. And those together are two very large rivers that come together right here in Bangladesh. <clears throat> so you can see Bangladesh has pretty low elevation for the most part. It's a pretty small country and has a low elevation. So what does that mean? A lot of good farming there. A lot of good sediment. Also a lot of floods. A lot of natural disasters. And we're going to talk about that more that more in a few minutes as well. So this is going to be part of that. So you've got different types of natural disasters. This is the plate boundaries. So if you remember when we talked very briefly in the very beginning about this kind of physical geography and what happens along plate boundaries, you have a lot of earthquakes. So there's a lot of earthquakes throughout this whole region. There's a lot of flooding. And there's a lot of flooding for a couple of reasons. One is, I've already told you the direction of the weather systems. They come in from the southwest, blow to the northeast. They hit these mountains, and they drop all their precipitation here on the front side of these mountains. So you've got a lot of water falling in these rivers and flowing through the, these lowlands up here through Bangladesh at the delta. So you have the potential for regular river flooding. Also... Consider this kind of like, in the United States, we call it Hurricane Alley, right? So in the Western Hemisphere, in our hemisphere, when we have tropical storms that reach hurricane strength, we call them hurricanes. They have the exact same type of storms in the Eastern Hemisphere, but they call them typhoons or monsoons. Or monsoons, I'm sorry, or annual rains. Typhoons are the storms. So typhoons are the same thing as hurricanes, so don't confuse that. Monsoons are the annual rains that come in that same season, but that more describes just the rains. So they get both up here. When big typhoons roll up through here, they go right a lot of times toward this river delta. <clears throat> you also have a lot of rain falling up here. So when we t these two hit in a very small area, in a very small country that has a very low elevation, you have some massive natural disasters with regards to flooding and storms. And a lot of people often die. I think the largest death toll from a, a tropical storm, hurricane slash typhoon, was here in Bangladesh. I think it was in 1970. I think that's on a slide a little bit later. Almost half a million people died in one storm if that tells you what they experienced there. Very, very difficult spot here for natural disasters in Bangladesh especially. So, see what I want to mention on here. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these slides. <clears throat> Again, they call this a double delta, even though the Brahmaputra actually runs in a little bit shy of the delta and becomes one river with the Ganges. They still call it a double delta. Um, it's all very low areas down there as far as the elevation goes. Um, so you're going to see a lot of crops grown there, like rice, that needs a lot of water in that area. Also in India, you have several higher plateaus. Um, a plateau is kind of a piece of land that's kind of elevated. Not a mountain. It's kind of flat top. Typically on top, it's... It's relatively flat. It's not flat, flat, but, you know, rolling hills, 
some maybe small mountainous areas like the Appalachians or something, but more or less a plateau is just an elevated piece of land. And you see there are several here in India. You've got the Chota over here, you've got the Central Indian over here, and you've got the Deccan, which is the largest down here. Each side of the Deccan, you have what they call ghats, eastern and western. That's basically lowlands, or, or lowlands along the coast is what those are. So you'll have a couple of questions on those on your, your assignments. So be, be ready to see those again. The Indus Valley, um, I'm going to let you read most of this in your textbook. Um, just keep in mind that this was one of those kind of cultural horse in ancient times. Um, there was a, a fairly complex and technologically advanced civilization that formed here about 2500 B.C. So just after some of the a little bit older ones back in the, the previous realm that we discussed back in the Fertile Crescent <clears throat> of Iraq and Egypt. Um, so this is another area, really a hot spot of, of ancient culture and development. So we start talking about kind of the timeline of India and Early in our history, about 1500 BC, they're invaded by Aryans. And that basically means people speaking Indo European language. So I put this other map down here to kind of show you Indo European language. So here would be the European languages over here, and down here is going to be your Indo area. Of course, this is India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. So you had people basically, and that's why I'm showing you this map, because it's very general. Aryans, when when we hear Aryans, we think about white supremacists, those kind of groups. That's just the local, <clears throat> I'm sorry, more recent regional <clears throat> use of the term Aryans. Um, it was kind of incorrectly given by themselves to these groups of people, these hate groups of people in the United States. Um, I think they're the master race and all that garbage. But... Basically, the Aryans refer to a, a, a wide area up here in Europe and eastern part of Asia. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the western part of Asia. Correct that. And they basically, in their different groups, kind of migrated toward India, came down this way. And as those large group of people migrated that way, they brought these languages with them. And these languages, you've got to understand, languages evolve over time. You know, the European languages, even English. Um, the English that we speak now is kind of a combination of Celtic, German, those ancient languages kind of put together. Um, that's why it's so much different than like the Romance languages, the Italian, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, they're considered more of their Romance languages. So, so these groups of people basically invaded, the simplest way to put that, from the northwest down to India. And they brought different culture, different languages with them. Now the primary religion in India is Hinduism. And that kind of emerged out of this Vedism text. You can read that about that in your textbook. And it kind of has, it kind of is hand in hand with the kind of the caste system that they have, the lowered system of, the I'm sorry, layered system so, social stratification that they have in India. Um, they have a different, definite hierarchy of cultural status in India, and it's very defined compared to really any other places. It's very similar in reality. You have your poor people and your middle people and your richer people it's the same kind of thing, but they have it really defined, and it's really rigid there on how they define who fits into what category. Um, what do I mention on here? This is all pretty much covered in your textbook. This is all about just languages. Um, just be sure you read about this in your textbook. I'm not going to go into this in great detail right now. So I mentioned that India is predominantly Hindu. I mentioned earlier that Pakistan and Afghanistan and Bangladesh are Muslim. But in the Ganges Basin, 
in the area of Bangladesh and northeastern India, you also had the birth of another religion, and that was Buddhism, around 500 B.C. So it started here in this region. But the, the odd thing is, is it kind of moved away from this region as it aged. Because, like I just said, India is predominantly Hindu. It has a, a sizable minority of Muslims in India as well. There are a lot of Buddhists in India. You can see here, less than 1%. Bangladesh is Muslim. But you see Bhutan up here in the corner, it does have a, a lot of Buddhism in there. And as you go into China, in Southeast Asia over here, you see Buddhism really popular in these areas. So it kind of moved to the east um, over time. Uh, I want to mention Sikhism. Um, the only reason I want to mention it, first of all, like it says here, it's a blend of Hindu and Islamic beliefs. So it's kind of, I want to say it's a new religion, but if it evolved after these two religions kind of met each other and intermingled. So Sikhism kind of evolved from these two religions. So about 2% of the population in India are Sikhs. The reason I want to pay attention to this is because sometimes you might hear about Sikhs in the news here in the United States. And it's unfortunate usually when you hear about them. Because one thing that Sikhs do do is, first of all, there are several of those here in the United States that immigrated from this region. Sikhs are very popular. They wear turbans. That's one of their things with their religion. They, they wear very predominant turbans. And if you don't know what a turban is, it's basically the wrap around the head of Sikhs, and some Muslims wore those as well. And what's unfortunate about that, I mentioned that, is because when you most hear about these people, is when there's a hate crime by some of these nuts in this country against what they think are Muslims because they see these turbans, they think these people are Muslim, but they're really not, so they're really Sikhs. So that's why I wanted to point that out. You might hear about Sikhs in the news sometimes. Usually if you do, it's in for an unfortunate circumstance like that. Um, there have been at least three or four that I remember in the last ten years or so where one of their groups or churches were attacked because they thought they were Muslim. So now we're going to talk about Islam a little bit, or the Muslims. Um... This kind of gives the history <clears throat> of how they moved into this area. And it mentions at the bottom, and it's dominant in Pakistan and Bangladesh, and also in Afghanistan. I think it tells, I don't want to jump ahead of myself here. Uh, the British kind of took over um, the area in colonial times. Um, they kind of took over where the Mughals left. We, the last slide kind of talked about that's where the, the Islam came from, from them coming in. And in the mid-1800s, the British took full power of most of India. Um, you see here from Britain's direct rule over India was 1857 to 1947, which is just after World War II. So that was a pretty lengthy time for colonialism. Um, by any standard, um, but they directly ruled the country. It's not like they just kind of imposed the rule early. They ruled the country for that period of time. The thing about colonialism is, and we mentioned this when we talked about the, the American realms early, it's always, there's, there's points that can be made that it, it brought some benefits, but mostly it was by subjugating people to terrible treatment. And that was the case here as well. Um, when the British there, they built ex transport networks, roads, railways. They helped with irrigation, cities. I mean, they improved the infrastructure, but it wasn't for the goodness of the Indian people. It was for their own benefit for the ones that lived there, basically. Um, but that deal helped the country in the future to have these resources in place. Um, they really made the native people a lot poorer there. Um, and anytime you have this type of colonialism in countries, 
it really stunts the growth of those countries because colonialism on the back of colonialism was they were doing that to get natural resources basically is what they were doing so they were using these countries for their natural resources so all the stuff they set up in those countries were for their own benefit now sometimes they left like the british pretty much left india when they finished this i mean a lot of british people probably stayed there i'm not saying all of them just packed up and left but still there's still a vast majority of people there are of indian descent it's not like here in the united states all of our natives are pretty much gone the native americans or what we call the american indians incorrectly they're almost gone i mean they're they're still here but very small in population they were pretty much wiped out in india in other countries the natives are still the vast majority of the population <clears throat> so what that did was was that kind of stunted the growth for that period of time from 1857 to 1947 when the British ruled the area, the native people didn't have an opportunity to better themselves and progress naturally like a civilization should. So when the British leave, then that's kind of like they're starting kind of, I don't want to say over, but from a place that they wouldn't have been if the British had never been there. So that's something important to remember about when we talk about colonialism. It also set up a help bolster that caste system you had certain people that are more privileged than others now even though they do have that caste system this is an extremely poor part of the world most of the indian people are below the poverty line easily now onto this slide <clears throat> i'm going to talk about the next several slides about some of the unrest in the area so the hindus and the muslims don't get along great with one another and as you can see you've already seen I've already showed you that this is a very diverse part of the world so most of the boundaries that we look at in most of the world were arbitrarily put in place by the colonial powers in other words back in the day these boundaries that are made today were kind of set up by these colonialists the british whoever it was and a lot of times they're arbitrary meaning they don't make sense with regards to the culture the religion the language they don't always match so you have places that there are disputed boundaries across the world especially in developing or underdeveloped countries where their boundaries were made by outsiders and that's what you have here you have pretty much the whole western edge of india the border with pakistan is kind of an uneasy place to be you have a lot of muslim minorities in this part of india there are a lot of hindus but there are a lot of muslims as well you have muslims in pakistan and you've got a place up here in the north called Kashmir that we're going to talk about in a few slides that's very tense because you also have china sitting right here on the edge too so when they made these boundaries a lot of people moved because they wanted to identify with one or the other country so you had a lot of migration and immigration as well so it really just was kind of messed a lot of things up when they did these type of things now at one time there was a West Pakistan which is Pakistan today and Bangladesh was actually called East Pakistan <clears throat> because they're most both Muslim countries even though if you see natives from each country they look different because they're from different parts of Asia there's a distinct difference in how they look because you're getting in over here more to the what we consider Asian look more like the Chinese culture or the Thai culture or the Vietnamese culture you're getting really close over here to that so you have a different look of people different cultures that they came from however just because both were Muslim they had West Pakistan and East Pakistan and you had India in the middle and in 1971 East Pakistan which is now Bangladesh gained their independence from West Pakistan 
And India kind of supported that because they didn't want to be in the middle of two, basically the same country, surrounded by them, so they are all for it. So Bangladesh became its own country in 1971. It's still Muslim, but they are probably one of the more progressive Muslim countries in the world as far as the way they treat their, their religion. <clears throat> now, I mentioned before Kashmir and Jammu up here in the northern part of the country. We're going to look at that a little bit closer in the next slide. But you also have India and Pakistan are both nuclear powers. Both of them have nuclear weapons. They had an arms race because they're always fighting, so they both obtained nuclear weapons early. And our involvement, the United States, is very complicated in this region. And I'll get to, into that in just a few minutes. So here's that very northern part that I was talking about of India. You see India here on this map. You see Pakistan over here, which is you've got Muslim, Hindu, and then you've got China over here. So this is just a clash of very different ideals, cultures, aggressors. Pakistan is very unstable. <clears throat> they can be very aggressive at times. They claim a lot of this territory. India claims a lot of this territory. China has taken some of this territory. Now, we see the red lines here. These are the kind of the differences. They're kind of boundaries between the regions, but they're not really defined political boundaries because nobody really has control of these areas right now. Right here, Azad Kashmir is under the control of Pakistan. These Lined light blue areas are under the control of China. But India says this is their boundary right here. Although China controls these. India also claims <clears throat> these both of these areas. However, Pakistan controls this part of Kashmir. And India kind of controls the area that called Jammu and Kashmir. Very, very complicated right in this area. And it's not uncommon for, <clears throat> for India to exchange shots with both Chinese troops and Pakistani troops in this area. Um, there's never any like really big battles and like you're seeing in like Ukraine or anything like that, or even when we were in Afghanistan. Nothing like that, but you'll hear every now and then, you know, three or four of them will kill each other um, in a border dispute, and they kind of get nervous because they think we're going to war, and then they'll kind of back down. So that's a constant thing up in this area. And you can read kind of about it through here as far as the, the details of that. Um, but I just wanted to point that region out to you. <clears throat> There's been several terrorist attacks in India um, from either native Muslim Indians or Muslims from other countries like Afghanistan or Pakistan. And it's just very tense in part, parts of these countries at, at times. The Taliban, you know them from Afghanistan. They are the, um, I guess you call them a political group, um, very ultra-conservative Muslim group that is pretty much a terrorist organization in their own country. Now, we've heard of the Taliban. That's who was in charge of Afghanistan when Al-Qaeda was there back if y'all are normal, traditional students, it was when you were very, very young. Um, but Al-Qaeda was a terrorist organization, a Muslim terrorist organization. That's who attacked and brought down the Twin Towers in New York back in 2001. Osama bin Laden was the leader of Al-Qaeda. The Taliban, who ruled Afghanistan at that time, allowed al-Qaeda to operate in Afghanistan. And that's where Osama bin Laden was for a very long time. After the Twin Towers happened in New York, we promptly invaded Afghanistan and pretty much took the Taliban and al-Qaeda out within a couple of years. Um, the Taliban really quick. Al-Qaeda, it took a little bit longer because they were hiding in 
kind of interspersed in the population. <clears throat> but within a couple of years, they were both out. So Al-Qaeda, even though Pakistan does not endorse them, they have cells in Pakistan as well. The Taliban also operate in northern Pakistan in the Kashmir area. So you have a lot of different political entities. You got Al Qaeda, you got Taliban, and you've got the Pakistani army up there. You got the Indian army up there. You got China. It's, it's just a big mess. Now we have always pressured Pakistan to control the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Now we are officially allies with Pakistan. But it's one of those things that we have to be friends with somebody, so it's them. We actually sell a lot of military equipment to Pakistan, but it's one of those deals where on paper we're allies, but they really don't like us very much. They're supposed to control Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, but they really don't. Um, and we actually, when we finally found bin Laden and... Um, Barack Obama gave the order to take him out. We killed him. He was in Pakistan. We did a raid in Pakistan without even telling the Pakistanis we were coming. We just rolled in there and took him out, and they were not very happy about us coming on their territory and taking him out. We also launched a lot of drone strikes in Pakistan. They don't like that very much either, but we don't really ask for permission. So <clears throat> the thing is, is it's a very tenuous relationship with these countries, with the United States, and also with India and China. Afghanistan, we've been talking about the pa Taliban. So I told you, we took them out. They were pretty much done for several years. And then we started lessening our military presence there because we can't just occupy the country indefinitely with our troops over there. So we started drawing down. And as we started drawing down, they were moving toward a democratic government and... But Taliban was gaining strength back in the rural areas. <clears throat> that culminated, I think, was it been a couple of years ago. Um, actually, Trump signed the order to evacuate all of our troops out of Afghanistan. And then it occurred after Biden took office and he kind of oversaw what happened. It was kind of a disaster the way it played out. It wasn't handled very well by either administration. But we're now out of Afghanistan. And as soon as we left, the Taliban took back over immediately. So they're now back in power in Afghanistan. So does, what does that mean for us? Probably not too much because they understand now that we will go in there and take them out if they do anything like they did before. So it probably won't affect us much directly like it did before. But it was a disaster for the women of that country and the citizens because they are very conservative, heavy-handed, just insanely ultra-extremist religious group. Um, won't let women go to school, things like that. So it's very bad for the country that they're back in power. But all this is kind of a mess up in that corner. That's what I want you to get out of that. So I'm not going to get into that. I've already talked about it, and it's in your textbook. <coughs> <coughs> so let's talk about China for a minute. So for a very long time... India was considered an ally of the United States as well. That sounds odd because we were both Pakistan's ally and India's ally, but they were fighting each other. But we tried to keep ties good with both countries. Recently, that's been shifting a little bit. India is growing. It's getting a little bit more standing in the world with their economy. And when I say growing, they've always been crazy growing population-wise, but I'm talking about economically and politically. They're getting a little bit more involved in world politics than they were in the past. So even though them and China kind of spar up here in this region over Kashmir, on the big picture, China's trying to get into India with regards to economic development and kind of ally with them. Because what China's trying to do right now, China's trying to become what we have been the United States for decades. And that is the superpower of the world. Um, not only militarily, but regards to trade and economy and all that. They're really spreading out 
and they're going to Africa, they're going to other Asian countries, they're allying with Russia, they're trying to make relationships all over the world. Now, they're not doing it all the goodness of their own heart. They have a goal in mind, and that is to be stronger, bigger economy, more powerful, more powerful military, and access to more natural resources. And it always goes back to those natural resources. China will always be superior to India because India is more of a, a primary economy with regards to they're going to supply natural resources. They don't produce a lot of goods. China uses those natural resources. They're more of a, a secondary economy because, or because they actually produce the goods from the natural resources. They have the factories there. So, so that relationship is always going to be advantage China unless India starts building factories, which is very unlikely. So for that reason, China is actually invested in building an immense highway road system through Asia, all the way over to the Middle East, through India, through Pakistan, <clears throat> around Southeast Asia, up to China. And again, remember, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart because they want to help other countries. They're funding this because they want more access to natural resources. This is the reason they're doing that. So here, as I kind of mentioned that before, that India is kind of on the rise. Still, though, remember, anywhere in the world, even here in the United States, when we talk about on the rise in resource, you know, resource extraction, um, economic growth, the higher class is getting most of that. The lower class, and when we have this many people in the country, they're going to be super poor. And, and poverty is, this entire area is one of the most impoverished in the world. Um, just because of how many people, the limited resources that they have. Uh, one in three children you see on this slide are malnourished in this, in this region, in this realm. And that last line said what I just said. The economic benefits of growth that they're seeing is not distributed to everybody. You see here, this is the chart just kind of showing the growth in manufacturing and all that. I'll let you read that in your textbook. The mega cities. Now, again, remember, I mentioned this in the beginning. Um, you have India, and really most of these countries in this area are rural countries. Most of the population knows in rural areas. However, they still have mega, mega big cities. Um, it's, it's unreal how big the cities are there and how dense they are, how densely packed the people are in these cities. So half the workforce you see there are employed in agriculture. So that's kind of misleading too because when you talk about agriculture in India, it's not like here. You don't see any big John Deere tractors driving around in these big mega farms um, like we've almost industrialized our farms. There it's subsistence farming. And when they do grow crops, it, they're smaller farms. <clears throat> There's no big, huge plantation type uh, row cropping like we have here. Now, there is some row cropping there, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, oh, right here. Um, the western part of the country basically grows your grains and wheat, things like that. That will be part of Pakistan and India. Eastern part, remember I said earlier, they get all the rain, the monsoons, the flooding. Rice is the big commodity over there. <clears throat> and there will be a question on your test about this, by the way, so be sure you're kind of pay attention to, to that, that graphic there. Um, I think there's a better graphic in your textbook about where the crops are actually grown. Um, let me see. What else do I want to mention here? So that last line there is pretty important with regards to this, this realm, especially India and Bangladesh. Because of the dependency on agriculture, it makes their population really susceptible to climate change. And especially here, and there's two reasons why. One is, we've already talked about, the storms, the flooding that hit Bangladesh and the Ganges lowlands up here. These storms have intensified with climate change, with global warming. They're going to, going to get worse and worse. You're going to have more devastating events. That's pretty straightforward. 
Another thing that doesn't talk about in your textbook is the heat waves that are experienced in India because of where it lies with regards to their climate um, systems and the way that the atmosphere moves. They're getting some severe heat waves in the summertime there. Just ridiculous. I mean, just the heat is crazy. And for those of you, anybody that's traveled outside the United States, and you, unless you travel to a very modern country, the vast majority of the world, nobody has air conditioning systems in their homes. If you go to India, the only only the richest people are going to have air systems in their homes. Everybody else just got a fan and open the windows. I mean, that's going to be it. So if you think about not only the countryside and the farming suffering from this, but the urban areas, the big cities where the people are just packed in there on top of each other, those heat waves are a miserable thing. And in a country with that many people, that's going to be hard on the population. Now, here's a map of the population distribution. Remember I told you, first of all, when you look at this realm, you, we've seen this map in other realms. And you see, like, up here in China, it's white because this is the low populated part of China. But you see vast areas in the other realms with big popul areas with little population. Almost this entire realm here is just packed with people, highly populated. And you can see India especially. This is the Indus Valley right here. This is going to be the Ganges Valley. Bangladesh is over here. And remember those coast, lowland coastal areas I told you about along here, that's where your highest populations are. Remember I told you the lowland areas where you can farm, that's where the highest populations are. Okay. So in the interior, though, you're still in the second highest rating of population density here. So we still have a ton of people in the interior of this. You see the little spots? Just, these are all million-plus people cities, each one of these has a million people in these cities. So that's what the little splotches are on the interior. So you can see the immense population density in this, these countries. Bangladesh is almost all in the highest population density. Now, Nepal and Bhutan, not so much. They're, they're high Himalayan countries. They're way up in the mountains, so you're not going to have hardly any people in those two countries. But the rest, a lot of people. So when we talk about population geography, there's a few things to look at in population geography. You're looking at people, but you're also looking about looking at demographic transition. What's that mean? How much is the population growing? Is it growing or is it shrinking? The age distribution of the population, the economics of that, that distribution, the gender bias and birth rates of that population. And what does that all mean? That all means is that's going to have to do, if you've got way more men than women in a country, then your population is going to stop growing because not enough women are there to have kids, right? If, if they're not in these women. Also, if you have a population that's primarily old, elderly, if half your population is like over 60, then there's fewer younger people, and as those older people start dying off, your population is going to start going down probably instead of up. So, I've already mentioned density. <clears throat> so you've got earth, arithmetic density, which means the what I said, the number of people per square kilometer in this case, or square mile we use here. The physiologic density means the number of people per unit of arable land, which means farmable land. So that means how many people per square kilometer of farmable land. So you that would you you would take out the mountains out of that equation, that's going to bump that density up even further. So this is just a straight population density. If you took a, away all the non-arable land, then you're going to have a higher density even than you're seeing right here. So, our value. so we've mentioned this before about carrying capacity in previous realms. Um, there's only a certain amount of people that any amount of land can carry. In other words, if you can't feed your population and you can't import food, then your population is going to have to decrease. People are going to start dying or starving or whatever the case. So that that's what carrying capacity means. And India is probably beyond their carrying capacity right now. 
so I'm just kind of reading over the slide. Uh, I need to start kind of cutting this because we're getting late in time. As I mentioned before, much of South Asia's population is illiterate and uneducated. Um, poverty rate is extremely high. Here is a little bit more on that demographic transition that I mentioned earlier. This is a very useful model here. If you look at it and really kind of take into account, this tells you where the population is going to expand. And that's basically when the birth rate stays level, the death rate, which declines steeply when you have a, a society that's advancing in medicine and taking care of its population, less people are going to die if the birth rate stays the same and your population is going to expand, right? But also, you have these other factors that you have to consider you have your different categories on here stage these are different stages of the model and this kind of tells you where it's going to grow you have a natural decrease here when your death rate exceeds your birth rate now another thing total population is showing this is con taking into consideration immigration so if you're getting a lot of people coming to your country but your birth rate stays the same and your death rate is dropping, then you're really going to have a population explosion. So immigration plays a role in this as well, so keep that in mind. So <clears throat> these are kind of curves. I'm a, this shows a little bigger on the next slide. So these are kind of population pyramids that differentiates male and female. Um, you can see there is more males than females typically in India. China, it kind of is somewhat equal in the males and female dif distribution, but you see in India, and this is 2019, and this is projected in 2024 on both of these. So you see the population is still growing in India. It's kind of tailing off just a little bit, but not that much. It's, it's still pretty even out here. But in China, you see it's dropping. And why do you think that is? Well, I can tell you a couple reasons why. First of all, <clears throat> it's higher up here in this region because in the last, I can't, don't quote me on it. I, I'll tell you specifically when we get to that realm. But in, at one point in the last few decades, probably 20 years ago or so, I'm guessing, but I might not be accurate on that. China's government instituted a law that limited families to, I think it was one child, maybe two, and they w couldn't have any more kids. It was a law. And they did that on purpose because they were, they had so many people and their population was growing so much they couldn't self-sustain. So they're a communist country. They made a law that said stop having kids. So that's why you see these numbers dropping as we get down into these age groups here. So it looks like here probably it was about 20 years ago or so that that happened. <clears throat> Another thing is a, a society gets more educated and more successful, birth rates go down anyway because people are more educated. Um, they're more educated on birth control. They're more educated on sustainability. Um, they just don't want to have as many kids. Plus, in an underdeveloped country like India, People have more kids because they need more kids to work their farms and things like that. A more progressive society does not need that help in the home. Therefore, people tend to not have as many kids. Um, sometimes you see an Amish family driving around here in a buggy that has like eight kids. That's one of the reasons they have so many kids, because they help them work on the farms and stuff. So that's what these are good for, if you ever see these. Um, gender bias in South Asia, um, I'll breeze through this real quick. Um, the only thing I want to make here is they put a lot more value on having boys than girls. It's so bad that a lot of pregnancies are aborted if they can find out what the gender is, if it's a female. And that has to do with entitlements, land, and inheritance. Men just have a higher place in society there. I'm not condoning that by any means. I think that's wrong. But that's the culture and that's the way it is there. And boys grow up to be bigger, stronger, and can help work more on the land. That's just the bottom line. That's how their culture thinks. <clears throat> Women are not treated well. Now, 
I mentioned earlier in Afghanistan, it was like illegal for girls to go to school and stuff like that. It's not like that in India um, or any other of the countries in South Asia. I don't want to make it sound like that. However, women are looked down on. Um, there are a lot of sexual assaults in India. Um, a lot of that has to do with the caste system that I mentioned earlier, some racial tensions or maybe religion tensions sometimes. So it's a difficult place for women, even even though they have rights, like not like in Afghanistan, they still have rights, but boys are preferred in the system. And again, that's wrong, but that's their system. Um, again, I touched on that instance of rape. You'll see this on the news every now and then. It's terrible. It's just terrible there in those regards. Now, on the flip side of that, all the countries listed here, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, have all had female prime ministers. So that tells you that they don't take education away from women or they don't take freedom away from women. It's just the attitude about it that's still a problem there. Now, getting into the regions, and this is to the point where I need to cut kind of short. Um, I'll let you read about these specifics in your textbook, but just keep in mind, basically the regions, <clears throat> you can almost divide by countries. So, <clears throat> I'll go to this one. So, the West is going to be your two predominantly Muslim, uh, Muslim countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan in the West. Those are a region to themselves. And then you've got Bangladesh in the east. is also Muslim, but it's a standalone because their culture is so much different than the western states. So Bangladesh is a region of all of its own. India is also a region of its own. And then the two others are the two northern mountain states. You've got Bhutan and Nepal, which are very mountainous states, very low populations, contrary to the other countries in here. And then you've got the southern islands which the large island here is Sri Lanka, and then you got the Maldives. Now the Maldives, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on any of these, but the Maldives are a small group of islands. They're very low in elevation. They're only like six feet above sea level, so climate change is probably going to take them out in the coming decades. However, that's a big tourist destination for Europeans, and you see a lot of these rich people, even from here, go to the Maldives. It's odd because it's a Muslim country. Um, however, tourism is king there, so they are very lenient on their beach resorts and all that kind of stuff. So again, I'm going to run through these just real quick because of our time. You can read about those these in your textbook. But you've got the Afghanistan and Pakistan zones here. Um, the Khyber Pass, um, remember that. You'll probably hear that on the test. It's a pass in the Himalayas. Um, up really high in the Himalayas. Uh, I'm just kind of reading through here and seeing if there's anything. I've already mentioned most of this previously. Here it goes into a little bit more detail about our invasion in 2001 after the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers. Um, I've already gone through all that. They have a, you'll see here, they have a water supply crisis. So, Pakistan is a relatively dry country, except for in the Indus Valley region. So, if you're in the Indus Valley region, you're good. But outside of that, they don't have a lot of good infrastructure to transport water from that region to the rest of the country. So, that's what it's talking about, having a water supply crisis. Punjab. Again, wheat farming, keep that in mind. It's going to be on your test. Uh, textile factories now, they have some here. Um, they have some cotton that's grown there. There's a lot of textiles in Bangladesh. That's what most of their non-farming jobs are in Bangladesh is textiles. Uh, again, this is a conservative, deeply religious, and a militant this particular province, but really the entire country, is pretty conservative Muslim country. And I'm not going to go into this right now. 
So we got India. We've already talked about India a whole lot, so I'm going to just kind of breeze through this and let you read the details in your textbook. The Sikhs, again, um, that's that mesh of Muslims and Hindus. And then you've got the Muslims here, but there's over 200 million Muslims in India. Um, it's it's the biggest minority religion in any country in the world. And I've already talked about the tensions between the Hindus and the Muslims. There are extremist Hindus as well. Hindu, Hinduism is typically not thought of as a real fanatical or kind of extreme religion. But there are some extremes that they want to kind of impose their beliefs on everybody else. And, and we have those here. We have Christian fundamentalists here. They want to impose their beliefs on everybody else here as well. Not not to these extremes. But it's it might not be far off from some of the stuff we see in the news today. The caste system, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these. Mumbai is a very, Kolkata and Mumbai both are very, very large cities. They're mega cities. And you can see on the map here, <clears throat> these are major urban economic regions that are circled in the green over here. So that kind of tells you, that kind of shows you the population, economy, big cities, and so on. The industrial sectors. And again, I'm just kind of breezing through this to kind of see. Here's that map I mentioned earlier, the better map about the agriculture, the crop zones. Again, <clears throat> this will be on your test. This, you see the rice over here. You see the grains more over in this region. So just keep that in mind. You see a little, <clears throat> a little rice down here and some lowlands down to the southern tip of the country. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Bangladesh, here we have, um, I mentioned earlier in 1971, gains its independence, a lot of subsistence farmers. Uh, one of the highest density, physiologic densities in the world. You saw, I pointed that out on the map earlier, how dark the whole country was because it's just packed with people. And you can see here how these rivers go up in here, the delta. When these typhoons roll up in this bay here, they just flood the lower half of this whole country. And then you have floods coming from these big rivers up here too. This is the Brahmutra here. This is the Ganges over here. They come together about right here. And all this is considered a delta, even though it's a little bit inland. <coughs> Here's that cyclone I mentioned in 1970. About 500,000 people were killed. It does have some positives. Um, they are progressing with their health care a little bit. Non-governmental agencies, basically charity organizations, have gone in there and kind of, they've, they've made a little bit of difference. Um, girls going to school has increased quite a bit, so the female issue rate's improving. <clears throat> so they've made a little bit of progress, but it's still a very, very poverty ridden country. Again, I mentioned this earlier, the textile capital of the world. So about three-fourths of all the jobs in the country that are not farming are in textiles. <clears throat> but, as you can see at the bottom, the factories aren't exactly nice. Um, pretty hot, dirty, probably very unsafe. Here are your two mountain countries, the northern mountain countries, Bhutan and Nepal. You can see they're just on the very top of these mountains. So there's not a lot of population up there. These share their culture a little bit more <clears throat> with East Asia. As far as their culture, um, how they look ethnically, they share that more with China and the East Asian countries than they do really with the Indian subcontinent area. <clears throat> Let me see. Just kind of going through here. One thing, one thing about Bhutan that, that I find interesting was for its entire history, they were a, a monarchy, 
a cons they had a constitution, but they had a monarchy in charge. So that means they had a king. <clears throat> but in 2007, this dude must have been a really good king because he just said, you know what? Um, we're going to start having elections, and you're going to elect your leaders for and pick a political party. So the king basically ordered they become a democracy. So now they're a multi-party democracy. So you don't see that happening every day. Usually in the world, it's the opposite. Um, dictators get in and have total control, and they, they want to get rid of democracy. But this guy, apparently a pretty good guy. <clears throat> so... Sri Lanka down here, it's off the coast of India. Pretty sizable island. And here's the Maldives I told you about. A lot of really small islands down here off the coast of India as well. You can see tourism is the big money maker there. And that's it. So, um, that's it for this lecture. Again, as always, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I don't know if there's any issues or anything unless you tell me about them. So if you need any help with anything, just let me know. Thanks.